Uh, so again, for today's webinar, a silent epidemic of mental health among prostate cancer survivors, a secondary analysis of the Canadian longitudinal study on aging. Um, let me please introduce our panelists, Louise Moody and Dr. Gabriella Ilia, or I I Ilia. I, I knew I was going to get that wrong. <laughs> um, Louise uh, Moody is a recent Master of Science graduate of Community Health and Epidemiology from Dalhousie University. She is now a second year medical student at Dalhousie. Uh, so, welcome to Louise and Dr. Gabriella Ilia is an endowed chair in prostate cancer quality of life research in the Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie. Her research examines the needs and challenges of men diagnosed with prostate cancer and prostate cancer survivors and actions this evidence-based information into tangible education and empowerment programs aimed at improving the lives of cancer survivors. So with that, and uh, I'm ready for my water now, um, I will turn it over to Louise and Gabrielle. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the introductions. So again, my name is Louise Moody and I'm a second year medical student at Dalhousie. And my uh, thesis supervisor, Gabriella, is here today. And so she'll be answering um, any questions at the end uh, during the Q&A. So I just want to start off uh, the presentation. One second, let me see if I can flip through. There we go. Okay, so um, I just want to start off by giving you guys a bit of background about our story of how we got here. So basically our story of how and why we're, we decided to do this research. So this research began five years ago and we started with identifying mental health issues in a survey of uh, maritime population of men diagnosed with prostate cancer and the survey started in march 2017 and by the end of 2018 uh, there were about 200 men who had responded to this survey and at this time we acknowledged that this sample was quite small and also it was quite heterogeneous in the sense that we had both patients and survivors uh, some of which who had been treated more than eight years ago. But nonetheless, at the time they took the survey, one in three and a half men screened positive for clinical depression and anxiety. And at the same time, we uncovered that survivors of prostate cancer have the lowest, so less than 20% um, attendance to cancer support groups, compared to 60 to 90% uh, in other forms of cancer. And these men feel lonely and isolated. They experience challenges in satisfying their emotional needs and most rate sexual dysfunction as their major concern. So this raised red flags for us. And the immediate question that arose was, uh, how does this compare to men in the general population who have never had a cancer diagnosis? At the same time that year, the European Neurological Association Conference had a presentation that showed that prostate cancer survivors uh, up to 18 years later had severe anxiety and depression. So this prompted us to look at the Atlantic PATH data as well as to put in a request for the CLSA data. So the Atlantic PATH data uh, had a population that included men who had never had cancer and men who had other forms of cancer as well as prostate cancer. And so in 2020, doctors Ali, Rutledge, and Sweeney published the results of their population-based study of 6,685 men residing in Atlantic Canada. And they found that survivors of prostate cancer had more than double the odds of screening positive for clinical depression and anxiety compared to men who had no uh, history of cancer, which was the control group. They also found that while men with a history of other forms of cancer had comparable outcomes with this control group. So basically two questions emerged from these investigations. And the first one was, is this an issue that pertains uh, to Atlantic Canada only given our, that we have the highest rates of cancer, including prostate cancer in the country? And this is what prompted our CLSA investigation. And the second question was, how do men with a prostate cancer diagnosis compared to men with other forms of cancer when it comes to their mental health? And is this situation that affects men with prostate cancer more than any other form of cancer, perhaps due to their low attendance to support groups, as well as their unmet psychosocial needs, such as feeling lonely and disconnected? So as I said, this second question was addressed in a study that was published at the end of last year by Drs. Ali Rutledge and Sweeney. 
showing that rates showing rates twice higher for anxiety and depression for prostate cancer survivors compared to any other form of cancer, especially among men with low socioeconomic status. So today, I will be presenting on my paper that was recently published in the Mood and Anxiety Disorder section of the Frontier Psychiatry Journal, which addresses this first question as to whether this is an issue across Canada for the prostate cancer population. This research was completed under the guidance of my thesis supervisor, uh, Dr. Gabriella Ilia, who's here today with me. So I'm just going to jump in right now. So in the background section, so prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among men in Canada and the USA. Currently, research indicates that one in seven Canadian men will develop prostate cancer during their lifetime. Although the incidence rate of prostate cancer increases faster with age than any other cancer, about 81% of prostate cancer diagnosed cases are diagnosed in the early stages of development when patients can receive effective curative treatment. Prostate cancer treatments have improved considerably over the decades and are providing very good curative results. However, patients are still at risk of complications and side effects, especially urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction. These side effects often negatively impact the, psycho the psychological well-being of these patients. What is most important to note is that the majority of prostate cancer patients become long-term survivors, so living greater than five years, with over 70% of patients expected to live 10 years or more uh, from the time of their diagnosis. So any unaddressed mental health uh, disorders can negatively impact their health long-term. So according to a literature review conducted in 2019 by Freveha et al., one in six men with a prostate cancer diagnosis will experience clinically significant depression, which was shown to contribute to poorer oncological outcomes. However, this paper was a review of the, of the literature at the time and it was based on small scale studies. So the rise in prostate cancer incidence with increased age combined with low prostate cancer mortality have important implications for the Canadian healthcare system. Men with co-occurring depression and prostate cancer are more likely to have worse quality of life, both short and long-term, increased risk of multimorbidity, increased mortality, and higher healthcare utilization than men in the general population. So existing studies examining the relationship between prostate cancer survivorship and mental health have not controlled for substance use. And this is important given the established relationship between mental health and substance use in the literature. Specifically, research shows that mental health disorders have long been associated with multimorbidity and unhealthy lifestyle coping mechanisms, such as alcohol use and smoking. As 99% of patients diagnosed with prostate cancer are over the age of 50, and about 65% are over the age of 65, they are more likely to experience the sequel of cancer treatment in, in the context of coexisting medical conditions. Studies show that individuals with multimorbidity have worse physical, social, and psychological quality of life. Reed et al. found that depression is two to three times more likely to be experienced by people with multimorbidity than those who have no chronic physical conditions. Alcohol use and smoking are known unhealthy coping mechanisms and risk factors associated with prostate cancer. Continued alcohol use and smoking after diagnosis can complicate treatment, increase risk for further malignancy, and contribute to secondary health problems such as cardiovascular disease and diabetes for prostate cancer survivors. Therefore, we chose to examine the prevalence of prostate cancer and examine the relationship between status of lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis and current mental health status while controlling for the contribution of multimorbidity, alcohol use, and smoking status in a large population-based sample of adult Canadian men who participated in the baseline data collection cycle of the CLSA between 2010 and 2015. 
All right, so as I'm sure many of you already know, uh, the CLSA is a national longitudinal research platform that collects comprehensive data and biological samples, which support a wide variety of age-related research. So our data was based on a sample of 25,183 men between the ages of 45 to 85 years of age. And, from, and this was from the slightly more than 50,000 uh, men and women across Canada's 10 provinces who participated in either the tracking or comprehensive cohorts of the baseline cycle. So all the variables in the analyses were assessed in both cohorts with the exception of psychological distress or the K10 variable, which was only assessed in the comprehensive cohort. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more when I'm talking about the results. Okay, so in terms of our uh, methods, so mental health was our main outcome variable of interest. So we used three indicators of current mental health that were available in the CLSA data set. And these measure different dimensions of the mental health construct. So the first one was the Center for Epidemiological Studies Short Depression Scale or the CESD-10. And the CESD-10 asks individuals about their depressive symptoms in the week. Therefore, it is a measure of current depression screening. So the CESD includes 10 items comprising six scales reflecting major facets of depression. So those included depressed mood, feelings of guilt and worthlessness, uh, feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, psychomotor retardation, loss of appetite and sleep disturbance. So our second uh, mental health uh, measure was the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale or the K10. So the K10 is a measure of uh, clinical screening for current symptoms of psychological distress, such as depression and anxiety within the past month. And lastly, we use the self-rated mental health. So this is a measure of one's perception of their overall mental health. Individuals uh, that participated in the CLSA were asked in general, would you say your mental health is excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor? And we included this measure to see if it would align with the objective measures, such as the CESD-10 and the K-10. So for our exposure variables, as you can guess, our main predictor was lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis. So in the CLSA, participants were asked, has a doctor ever told you that you had cancer? And if the participants uh, answered yes, then they were prompted with a further question, uh, what type or types of cancer were you diagnosed with? For our multimorbidity variable, we included 26 chronic conditions as they either met the definition of a chronic condition or have been included in previous multimorbidity studies, such as diabetes, heart disease, thyroid conditions, osteoporosis, arthritis, et cetera. And then our final exposure variable uh, was substance use, and this had two facets. So the first was alcohol use. And the item we used from the CLSA was frequency of alcohol consumption in the past 12 months. And then for smoking or tobacco use, uh, we used the item frequency of smoking in the last 30 days. So for our covariates, we uh, selected these based on previous literature indicating that these variables are associated with mental health. So we use six covariates, age, province, education, household income, marital status, and ethnicity. And the categorizations that we used are on this slide here. So for all analyses, uh, complex sample analysis using IBM SPSS version 25 was employed with GeoStrata and entity ID variables used as strata variable and cluster variable respectively in the design module. And to make the estimates generalizable to the Canadian population and to address the complexity of the CLSA survey design, we use trimmed or inflation weights in the descriptive analyses and analytic weights in the regression analyses as recommended by the CLSA protocol and which were available to, the, to us in the data set provided. So for analyses with the outcome measure psychological distress or K10, we used the cohort, the comprehensive cohort um, as the K10 questionnaire was only available in, in that survey. So our sample size was smaller for this. So it was 14,777. 
and we used multiple imputation and that was ba performed based on 5.5% uh, of the outcome variable missing. And so all our analyses that include psychological distress uh, were reported for both the original and the multiple imputation pool data. And uh, you can find those tables in our paper. Uh, and I, when I'm discussing the results, I'll let you know when the MI uh, multiple imputation results were comparable with the original data. So just one sec. <laughs> All right, so now we'll get into the results. All right. So um, for results, an estimated 4% of adult men reported a lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis. So this corroborated the prevalence of prostate cancer in the Atlantic Path data. Of the, Canadi of the Canadian men who reported a lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis, 72.8% were over the age of 65. The majority of men who reported a lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis were married or common law, so 83.7%. Uh, and over 70% of men who reported a history of prostate cancer had a household income of less than $100,000 per year. And of those, 29% reported a household income of less than $50,000 per year. So in these descriptive analyses, uh, increased household income and education were protective factors for uh, lifetime history of prostate cancer. All right, so I know this table is a little small, but I highlighted the, the two most important results and I'll verbalize them now. So in the logistic regression analyses, um, which were adjusted for covariates and the complexity of the design, uh, revealed that men with a lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis has statistically significantly higher adjusted odds of screening positive for psychological distress and depression, but not for self-rated uh, mental health compared to men who had received a prostate cancer diagnosis. So the top blue box up there, that's um, for psychological distress. And so men with a lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis had uh, higher adjusted odds. And so it was 1.52 times higher um, of screening positive for psychological distress. And in this case, the uh, multiple imputation uh, data set was comparable with this result. And then for depression, it revealed that men with a lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis had statistically significantly higher adjusted odds, so 1.24 times higher of screening positive for depression. And that's the, the bottom blue box there that's circled. And then, as I said, um, it was there was no uh, statistically significant relationship between lifetime history of prostate cancer and then the poor uh, self-rated mental health um, variable. All right, so getting into the multiple logistic regression analyses, um, these were adjusted for uh, the covariates as well as the complexity of the design. And we examined the contribution of lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis, multimorbidity, smoking, and alcohol use on each of the three mental health outcomes and revealed a statistically significant contribution of all four predictors to depression, but not to psychological distress or self-rated mental health. So first, I'm going to be talking about uh, the relationship with depression or the CESD questionnaire. And so that's the middle column with the, the sky blue um, boxes. So uh, the odds were, so the top box there, um, the odds were 1.32 times higher for screening positive for depressive symptoms among men with a lifetime history of prostate cancer compared to men without a lifetime history of prostate cancer. And then when you move down a box to look at multimorbidity, uh, the odds were 1.62 times higher for screening positive for depression among men with multimorbidity compared to those without multimorbidity. And then when we look at alcohol use, men who were weekly drinkers or daily drinkers had odds 1.18 and 1.47 times significantly higher for screening positive for depression respectively. And then finally, that last sky blue box um, is looking at uh, tobacco use or smoking. And so daily smokers also had a 1.57 times higher odds of screening positive for depression uh, at the time they were being surveyed compared to, to non-smokers. And then if we go over to the left column, so that's the, the dark blue, um, that's psychological distress. 
And so lifetime history of prostate cancer uh, was not a statistical significant contributor of screening positive for psychological distress. Um, but when we, in the original data set, but when we did the multiple imputation analyses, it showed that among men with a lifetime history of prostate cancer, odds were 1.62 uh, times significantly higher for screening positive for psychological distress compared to men uh, without a history of prostate cancer. And so again, that multiple imputation data is available in a table that's um, in our published paper. So then if we look at the, the dark blue boxes, so that first one there, that's looking at multimorbidity. So the odds were uh, 1.64 uh, higher for screening positive for psychological distress in the multimorbidity controlled analysis. So, um, and the results there were comparable with the multiple imputation data. And then uh, men who identified themselves as weekly drinkers had 1.52 uh, times higher odds. And those who identified themselves as daily drinkers had 1.59 uh, greater odds of screening positive for psychological distress uh, than non drinkers. And again, that was comparable in the multiple imputation data. And then finally, that last dark blue box on the left, uh, that um, is men who identified themselves as daily smokers, and they had 1.84 times higher odds for screening positive for psychological distress compared to men who identified as non-smokers. And then finally, we'll look at the last column there on the on the far right. So uh, that is for um, poor self-rated mental health. So lifetime history of prostate cancer was not a statistically significant contributor of poor self-rated mental health. Um, but then if you look at the multimorbidity, so that, that top um, blue box on the right-hand side, odds were 1.97 um, times higher for poor self-rated mental health among men with multimorbidity than those without. And uh, if you look down at alcohol use, so the next box, odds were 1.58 times higher for self-rated uh, poor mental health among daily alcohol drinkers compared to uh, men who identified themselves as non-drinkers. And lastly, men who identified as daily cigarette smokers had 1.45 times higher odds for poor self-rated mental health compared to non-smokers. So uh, our covariate results, which I don't have in the table in this presentation, but again, are available in our published paper, but I'm just gonna summarize some of it. So the covariate results um, from our final analysis also indicated that younger age, not being in, currently in a relationship, lower household income and residing in Atlantic Canada may be placing men at higher odds of mental health disorders uh, than being of older age, being currently in a relationship uh, having over $150,000 total household income and residing in Alberta. Right. Okay, so to get into the discussion, so to our knowledge, uh, this is the first study to assess the prevalence of prostate cancer survivorship in Canada. And results indicate that 4% of adult men in this Canadian uh, population-based sample reported having had a lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis between 2010 and 2015, when uh, the baseline cycle of CLSA was collected. So as I said, this estimate is comparable to the 3.9% prevalence of estimate of lifetime history of prostate cancer in Atlantic Canada between 2009 and 2015 that was characterized by similar demographic uh, characteristics through the Atlantic PATH data. And those results are available in the paper by Dr. Ilya Rutledge and Sweeney. So our results indicate greater psychological distress and depressive symptoms among Canadian men who reported a lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis compared to men who had no history of prostate cancer uh, diagnosis in the, these demographic controlled analyses. And so to our knowledge, this is the largest population based uh, study examining these associations. So results corroborate findings from previous smaller sample size investigations and indicate that mental health disorders are significantly prevalent among prostate cancer survivors compared to men who have never had a prostate cancer diagnosis. 
and support evidence that mental health care should be part of the prostate cancer uh, survivorship plans. While a statistically significant association between lifetime history of prostate cancer diagnosis and validated mental health outcomes, so psychological distress and depression, uh, was observed, and the status of lifetime history of prostate cancer was not associated with self-reported mental health. So a scoping review of the relationship between self-rated mental health and validated measures of mental health show that these measures, though related, should not be considered equivalent or interchangeable because self-rated mental health may be measuring people's commonly held perception of mental health and may reflect uh, equating the question to mean whether or not the individual looked uh, for mental health help or resources available to them in their communities. Evidence shows that men tend to report less self-perceived disorders although the rates of social isolation and suicide are higher among men compared to women. These differences may point to the possibility of less communication or verbalization of mental health problems among men and or more issues of shame or guilt around acknowledging these problems among men. All right, so our results were uh, not without limitations. So, first and foremost, the nature of the data is retrospective and self-reported. Thus, it is subject to the challenges of accurate recall and also survivor bias. Since the CLSA data uh, does not capture the date of prostate cancer diagnosis, survivorship time could not be controlled for in these analyses and may have biased the results. The overall response proportion uh, in the CLSA data was around 10% which although was adjusted for um, by the use of the population-based weights may have introduced a non-response bias. And finally, uh, since multimorbidity and substance use increased the risk of mortality, the proportion of cases with high multimorbidity and heavy substance use may be lower in our data and could have led to an underestimate of the odds ratios observed. So despite these limitations, this project offers uh, important contributions by providing evidence of poor mental health outcomes among Canadian men with a history of prostate cancer diagnosis by examining data from a large scale national population based survey that used a standardized protocol. So to reiterate, the use of the CLSA data set was the main strength of our project and all the following strengths are related to the information that was available to us uh, in this robust survey. So the use of three validated mental health measures, the CESD10, K10 and self-rated mental health is a strength. Additionally, the breadth of information collected uh, allows for several potential confounders to be controlled for in our analyses. And another important consideration is that we were able to capture 26 chronic conditions for inclusion into our multimorbidity variable. All right, so just to conclude, I'm gonna talk about um, implications of this research, both for researchers and clinicians. So our present findings caution us to be particularly attentive to symptoms of mental health among men when they are observed. Our results also further emphasize the importance of including validated questionnaires and prostate cancer uh, survivorship plans to assess mental health disorders among prostate cancer patients during their survivorship journey. And also the implementation of innovative and integrative patient education and empowerment plans through holistic interventions that aim to ease the psychosocial and physical needs of these survivors is warranted. So some of those psychosocial and physical needs include loss of sexual function, urinary leakage, feeling disconnected from their intimate partners and close family members and friends, lack of sleep and fatigue. So currently our lab is in the middle of a, a, a phase three RCT that helps address loneliness, disconnect and prehabilitation in this population to help alleviate some of this mental health distress. So um, just in conclusion, I just want to acknowledge again the CLSA 
um, for providing this data set um, that we use for all our analyses, uh, as well as the Solstice Lab supporters and members. So Frank and Debbie Sobey, as well as the Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation. And um, again, this research was based off of uh, the work I did for my master's and the community health and epidemiology program here at Dalhousie. And so I had two um, supervisors, Dr. Gabriella Ilya, as well as Dr. Susan Kirkland, who is a co-principal investigator for the CLSA. Um, and then Dr. Pan Andreu and Dr. Raul Brutledge, who were on my thesis committee as well. And then I have to acknowledge my parents, Marina and Doug, for all their support um, over the last few years. So, yeah, those are just some references from the slides um, today. And again, those can all be found in our paper. And I just want to thank you guys all for listening. And Gabriella and myself are here to field any questions that you may have. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think it was uh, definitely a, a very important topic, especially for uh, men, clearly. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions sort of formally, even though uh, questions could have been coming in uh, throughout. Um, so just a reminder, your muting will remain on and you can enter your questions into the chat box, which is in the, the bottom right of your corner. Um, but first, I just wanted to touch base on uh, one of your last points about um, the RCT you're, you're currently conducting. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, yes, yes. So it became very apparent uh, right about five years ago that we're dealing with a silent epidemic of unmet needs. Mm -hmm. Unmet needs at all stages of the prostate cancer diagnosis. So really pointing out to the fact that we can't ignore psychosocial um, uh, requirements, things like lifestyle, things like really finding out what happens after you get a prostate cancer diagnosis. What sort of active treatments are there? What are the implications associated with them? And now that you got a cancer diagnosis, are there some ways in which you can control the direction of the diagnosis? Uh, could you change? Could you improve your lifestyle? Could you change your diet and eat better? And if so, what should you eat? What should you avoid? Could you con control the amount of exercise? Should you maybe start exercising? Or if you're exercising only once a month, could you bring a little bit of routine into that to help you along? Are there any things that are prehabilitating, meaning the sooner you do them, the better it's going to be? So, for instance, we know that having a high BMI and going into surgery is not a good thing because that surgeon is going to have to navigate through that fat. So, so getting rid of it before your surgery, it's a good thing. And of course, in a healthy manner. So uh, we basically went to the literature with the help um, of patients. So we had patients involved in this research from day one, and now we have almost an army of research citizens that are cheering us along the way and being involved in every aspect of mm -hmm. our research. We don't make any decisions without patients' involvement. And because they give us a reality check, including this intervention that we developed, they said, well, let's, let's talk about us and what happens here, because we don't want to end up with yet another intervention on which billions of dollars are being spent, and it sits there on an internet uh, site, and nobody's using it. So very important to bring the voice of the patient back into the medical system, see whatever science is there to support patients and empower them from day one. Really oncological outcomes can be improved by working with a patient, by informing them rather than leaving them in a black hole. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know uh, what side effects. You don't know how to navigate your way through appointments. There's a lot There's a lot of unknown there. And that plus the big cancer diagnosis creates a lot of anxiety. And especially in a time like this one, on, on top of it, you have a world pandemic. So it is so important mm -hmm. to, to start looking at what we have and do better. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can so, talk about this. So we're, we're, we're so yeah. passionate about yeah. it. Yeah, you're definitely clearly passionate about it. So just in terms of the RCT, what, um, what were the interventions that were part of the the uh, RCT. I'm just curious about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we do, we do have a, a, some questions that are coming up as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so the intervention has um, uh, uh, an exercise component 
which includes also pelvic floor exercises, which are very important for men um, who have been diagnosed with a prostate cancer diagnosis because they have uh, potentially they could have erectile dysfunction or urinary dysfunction. So it's important to to engage in pelvic floor exercises that are rehabilitating, and we know that they work well when they're started before the actual uh, active form of active treatment. So there is an exercise component, there is a diet component, there is a social connection component, there is an intimate intimacy education and sexuality education, um, and um, and there is a meditation and stress reduction. Um, which involves a biofeedback mechanism. Uh, so we did a proof of concept uh, at the beginning of 2019. That worked very well. We published the results of the study. Uh, we uh, showed that not only is it feasible and it's working and men will, will engage in that routine, mm -hmm. but that actually there are results that we're noticing even after 28 days. Now, we're in the middle of an RCT that goes on for six months. As soon as you get diagnosed, um, you are, so, so the RCT either assigns you to the intervention or the standard of care. A six months, the program gets evaluated. We have weekly compliance surveys. Um, we also have daily videos that are sent to people. So it's very engaging. We get together with everybody in the team um, once a month, all the patients in the trial. So it's very uh, supportive from, from a social point of view and social interaction and social connection. Uh, and then we evaluate again patients um, at a year later. So patients in the late group get to get the program six months later. So nobody's left out. So it's a wonderful design and um, we have already run a, a few preliminary analysis and the results are looking amazing so far. But we only have about uh, 50 men that have completed the trial. So we're in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So uh, one question we had is whether you controlled uh, for physical activity. Um, mm -hmm. I presume this isn't from your original, the, the main uh, study that you're talking about today, not the RCT. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you mean in the CLSA analysis? Yeah, we no, we no, didn't. We didn't. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, okay. no, so, we didn't um, control for this particular lifestyle. No, no. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, in terms of, there's also a, a very positive comment from Valentina, just uh, emphasizing the fact that you're um, addressing the psychosocial determinants of health and uh, that this is a very important to patients with prostate cancer. So that's just a kudos to you. Um, uh, next question, which I usually also ask, because my background is in knowledge translation, is um, mm -hmm. how do you envision this study may change uh, policy? Um, and I guess I was thinking, you know, or have you? Do you have any pa partners, um, you know, like yes. Canada or, or whatnot? Yeah, uh, yes, we've done quite a bit of work in terms of implementation. In fact, we're in the middle of uh, planning for phase. For <laughs> RCT, it's an implementation study that we're going to run throughout Canada, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. We have received some money for funding, and we're waiting a result of yet another funding um, opportunity for which we applied. But we are talking with a lot of state. There are a lot of stakeholders in that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and and including including here in Nova Scotia. So we're already rolling the ball to make the standard of care within our own um, uh, province, and so. Yeah, uh, many from Prostate Cancer Canada to Movember to which are the, the typical organizations yeah. that support this kind of research. Uh, incredible uh, research, uh, citizen support, patient support, mm -hmm. um, not just here, but throughout Canada and in New Zealand and, and uh, Australia. We have established groups of research citizens in New Zealand mm -hmm. and Australia that are so excited to help along. We have a group of mentors, people that have gone through the program that don't want to say goodbye. They want to remain involved and they want to make sure that they help along. So lots of ideas on the table, but but most importantly, this phase four randomized clinical trial, which are, is going to start this year. So exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, there's a mess. There's a, a chat from Prakash here. Oh, I just lost it there. Um, I think Prakash, I think you were more asking something more general. So I might encourage you to send me a a, a, a message or send the team a message about um, access to CLSA data more generally. Um, okay, so in terms of the current presentation, do you know um, if any of the men with prostate cancer in the study attended support group meetings? Oh, and yes. also, second part to the question, yes. did attending the meetings result in reduction in any depression um, or anxiety? So, yeah, so from this study that I presented on today, we didn't have um, access to that variable in the CLSA data set, like if they had attended 
um, cancer support groups, as well as I mentioned that like we also didn't have a date of diagnosis, so we didn't know their survivorship time. So all of those things would have really aided um, in our analyses. Um, but I, and then to, to answer the second part, I, we know from um, other research that we've done that attending these meetings can uh, really drastically help reduce anxiety and depression as, as well as distress for these men. Um, but we didn't have access to that in, in this uh, study. Um, and uh, just going back to the RCT, which you had talked about, what was the control arm for the study? Mm -hmm. The control arm is, is currently standard of care. So uh, men go through the normal, you know, um, standard of care. So they would have their appointment with their urologist or radiation oncologist um, and um, have their form of active treatment and uh, just you know, follow along. Um, I'm not seeing, I hope I got everybody's <laughs> questions. There's also another sending kudos and congratulations on an excellent presentation uh, from Louise and her master's work. So for all of her so the important work of the Solis Lab and Gabriella's larger prints prostate cancer research portfolio. So I think that's just a testament of the great work that uh, that you're doing. Oh, um, Louise is phenomenal. I, we have, I mean, she, I'm, we're so proud of her. And this is, imagine someone that is being trained to be a medical doctor. And she said access to this type of research, yeah. talking to patients directly yeah. uh, from the start of her master's program, mm -hmm. which even before. Even before, even yeah. Before. And it's, yeah, one of the things I think that stood out to me the most do, um, doing like the preliminary RCT stuff was um, like this age group and this this group of men that come to these like interventions, they are so dedicated and they want they want it to work and they they come to everything and put 120% effort in and it, like that is phenomenal to see. And I think that really shows like, you know, that there is a need for this. Like they they want this kind of intervention. They want this holistic approach and they have the time and the dedication to to put the work in mm -hmm. um, and the results have been quite amazing so far. And I know like they will be even more in the future. And I think it's just a true testament to like the patients like want and, and need yeah, being and filled. It's so important it is to get them involved. Exactly. You know, bring yeah. the voice of the patient back mm -hmm. into the medical system. There's a lot of wisdom there mm -hmm. and, and practicality. And, and with something as you know inexpensive of the, as this is the program that, that we're working on and it's easy to be sustainable clinicians love it nurses love it why because they, they don't have to do as much maintenance on those patients you know mm -hmm. um so and it's easy to be implemented at the end of the day this is a good program for all of us i mean listen any one of us yeah. could get a cancer diagnosis tell me something would you like to actually be empowered mm -hmm. by information that is good for you and again nobody's forcing you to do anything but you might want to try it. You might just want to try it. <laughs> and what we're seeing from our patients is that they are eager. They want to try. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to change something. And they want to do it as soon as they get their diagnosis. Yes. They don't want to have to wait and wonder and create their own narrative about what's happening mm -hmm. and, and go into that depression hole where you don't quite know and, you know, you start thinking of the worst and, uh, and then you start isolating yourself because you're saying, you know, I'm going to go through this alone. I went through you know, bad things before I'm just going to go through this on my own because look, that, that erodes your soul mm. and it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the medical system. Who's going to now end up having to spend money and, and find resources to treat them. Uh, doesn't help the, the patient, doesn't help the family, doesn't help anybody at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a, an upstream approach, which uh, we need more of in the healthcare system. Um, I think we had a, I don't know, let you determine uh, if you want to answer this, but I guess there's a question of why you became interested in this topic. And so I don't know if this is directed towards uh, Louise or Gabriella, but you're both interested in it, which, yeah. you know, if you want, feel free to comment or not, or I can tell. Um, yeah, I can comment on it a bit and then I, Gabriella can go into more detail about prostate cancer and particularly. But uh, what was interesting for me is I, I decided to uh, pursue my master's degree and I reached out to the department and I by a, a, like honestly a stroke of luck somebody put me in contact with Gabriella because we have similar backgrounds so I had just completed mm -hmm. my um, undergraduate degree in, in neuroscience and religious studies and had always been interested in kind of the psychosocial um, you know part of patient care and so and Gabriella was just beginning her she had just moved to Halifax 
And so we got connected that way because of our shared backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And then Gabriella had the, the solstice chair position in mm -hmm. prostate cancer research. Mm -hmm. And so kind of the combination of mm -hmm. the prostate cancer research and then our both our collective um, like appreciation for just mental health mm -hmm. care, we, mm -hmm. we kind of went down this path. And I'll just tell you very briefly yeah. my story. So mm -hmm. I came from University of Toronto where I did research on quality of life, but mm -hmm. concussion, brain tumor. Completely. I mean, going from brain to yes. Okay, so so I started my research. So I got a position, a chair in in prostate cancer quality of life research here at Dalhousie University. And what attracted me because at that time I had three offers. I could have gone in three different directions. Well, two of them much more similar to what I was doing before. And then there was this Dalhousie University position. Mm -hmm. But what really got me was that the actual there was there was a so Frank Sobe donated money for an endowed fund to to support research that sheds a light on the issues that men with this condition have to go through and i talked to him and i i remember being i mean when i started the position i never thought this is going to be so focused on mental health which i had such extensive background on because prior to that i had over 50 publications in mental health and substance use and how adverse health correlates mm -hmm. influence the quality of life of uh, people that had had a concussion or brain tumor and so on I thought that this is going to be very this prostate cancer. I've heard about sexuality being, uh, you know, affected by the disease. I didn't know almost anything about prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And I went, the first thing I did, I remember, I picked up the phone, I called David Bell, who's a urologist here in, uh, in Halifax, and I said, I want to learn. I want to go everywhere. I want to go to every support group. I want to see patients. I want to hear what's happening. And I remember interviewing clinicians and I said, okay, tell me, tell me what's the biggest issue here. And they said, Gabriela, you know, we love them so much. We do our best, but you know, I'm focusing on the surgery or mm -hmm. I'm focusing on radiation or mm -hmm. I'm focusing on chemotherapy. And why don't you ask the patient? Mm -hmm. What they feel is messy. Honestly, yeah. honestly. And I started going to support groups and I was very open. I said, I want to know everything. Tell me what's going on so I can start pulling together. Go go out there and find out the golden standard questionnaires, put them together and survey you. And I, I didn't tell them what I'm going to survey them on. And of course, with my background, I just went, you know, psychosocial from left 180 degrees, the whole board. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to know from them directly. And they started talking. And then this is what I did. My, uh, even to now, I'm still still attending support groups. Mm -hmm. I dedicate in my free time, my holidays, I spend going to prostate cancer support groups or mm -hmm. cancer support groups. And I give them everything I've got, mm -hmm. all the knowledge, all the papers that I read, everything that I have goes right back to them. And it's empowering. It's empowering to me. Mm -hmm. It makes my life purposeful. Mm -hmm. Because here we are, we're a community, we're so much more alike than different. Those are issues that can affect all of us. Mm -hmm. And so lo and behold, through, through the survey, we find out that there is an epidemic of yeah. mental health issues. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. And then you start to scratch your head. Well, why is that? Mm -hmm. And so and we're still doing so many investigations. We're looking mm -hmm. at sexuality, urinary function. We're looking at relationships. We're looking at this idea of meeting emotional needs, social support. What does that even mean? And, and mm -hmm. what role do they play? So this RCT that we put together and the intervention, which is called Prostate Cancer Patient Empowerment Program, which is a trademark now, it's, it's something that, <laughs> yeah, it took years to develop. Yeah. It took science. It was top down, meaning scientific evidence into the intervention, but also the wisdom of the patients yes. going back to so bottom up. And I think there has to be a marriage of the two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Strong, who's the, the, the president of CHR, I think we have some amazing people in leadership today that really get it that you can't do research without involving the patient. If you're going to say something or do something about the patient that affects the patient, you ought to ask the patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important. Yeah, I think yeah. we all, I think we, most people would, would agree on that. Yeah. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in and uh, I, you know, thank you again for a very uh, passionate uh, presentation. I think one of the more passionate presentations or webinars that we've had. Um, so thank you again uh, for your participation in these webinar series. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline uh, is April 14th of next month. Uh, please visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data, including the COVID-19 questionnaire study data, as well as additional details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their survey, uh, which is located under the polling option. Option, If you didn't see it beside the chat button, please click the drop down arrow and it will come up. 
Um, so our next webinar, um, sadly, today's webinar does need to come to an end. Um, is entitled the impact of COVID-19 uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic on the mental health of older adults, a longitudinal analysis from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And we will have Dr. Perminder Reina, who's the lead principal investigator of the CLSA, um, lead that webinar. Uh, the webinar will present findings on mental health outcomes uh, from the COVID from the CLSA COVID-19 questionnaire study. So it actually will be a nice follow up from uh, the, the webinar focused on mental health this month to uh, talking about COVID next month. Um, and remember the CLSA does promote this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And we invite you to follow us on Twitter at CLSA underscore ELCV. And finally, just thank you once again for everybody attending and to our presenters and we will uh, see you next month. Thank you.